Hi, I'm Mike Chang, and I'll be talking about minimum viable documentation for RESTful APIs. Before we begin, let's start with a look at the world in this difficult time. In the hope that we can stay together and yet stay socially distant. At the end of this talk, some of you may say, yes, I'm set, we've got great documentation for our APIs. For the rest, I have elements of an action plan for you. Of course, you'll have to fill in the blanks to match your own APIs. If you want a copy of my slides, they're available online at this URL. And if you forget to copy this, I'll have this URL periodically at the bottom of some of my slides. Now to introduce myself, I call myself a documentarian, also known as a technical writer. I work for a company called GitLab, and we refer to ourselves as a single application for the entire DevOps lifecycle. I'm responsible for GitLab documentation in our managed space, but that's a long story. Before becoming a tech writer, I wrote a few books, including one on the Red Hat Certified Engineer exam. I also help with meetups for the Write the Docs organization. We have nearly 50 meetups worldwide, but for now, we're all virtual. At this point, if I were speaking to a live audience, I'd ask you to stand up when I called out your job function. But this is a virtual talk, so let me just say that I, I'm always surprised at the number of developers who attend the talk, and I'm pleased with the interest. So what is this minimum viable documentation, MVD for short? Well, James Higginbottom has a template for something similar. He calls it a minimum viable portal. And I think it's a great starting point. But to me, it's just that, as MVD is more than just a bunch of endpoints. It's more than just reading code. Your RESTful API docs, even your GraphQL docs, really your docs as a whole, need to provide a excellent developer experience. So the spoiler here is that what we're talking about is all about the developer experience, DX for short. And Christoph Brantome, the guy behind API the Docs, presented a slide a few years back that describes how developer experience is an inverse function of API friction. And the friction you put in your APIs includes any problems that you might have in your documentation. And you want documentation that provides an excellent developer experience because developers and the rest of us are people too. You've got to respect their time. A lot of people will ask, especially coders, they'll ask, why do you even bother with documentation? In this age of literal code, all you have to do is just read the code and the meaning of what's being done is apparent. So they'll say that code, it's self-documenting. Well, I'm going to make an analogy here. Here's my example of self-documenting code. It's human DNA. To me, it's self-documenting in the same way. And in fact, in some ways it's simpler. It only has four nucleotides. And I won't try to pronounce these, but you can combine them in such complex ways to create, uh, plainly to create us. And the complexities of those nucleotides take so much time to document, they've tried to set things up in something called the Human Genome Project. While I can't pretend that RESTful APIs are as complex as human genes, I can make an analogy here as there are four nucleotides, there are four rest commands, create, read, update, and delete. And in a similar fashion, we set these up as endpoints using the 
specification known as the Open API Initiative. And there are a lot of people out there who've used the Open API spec to create what seems like a world of endpoints. And this is great as a starting point. Thank you, Open API Initiative. It feels like we're covering the world with endpoints. But there might be a problem with this. When you look at it closely, you think, oh my God, there are walls of text. I'm fortunate to speak to audiences with a lot of brains. I bet a lot of you know more than one language. When I first learned French, one thing I picked up was a dictionary. But seriously, if my teacher told me, Mike, all you need to do to learn a language is learn the dictionary, I would have walked out. In the same fashion, if all you do with your readers is present endpoints, being a little blunt, I think they should walk out too. What you need is to present practical experience, to give them practical situations, use cases, if you will. Nevertheless, the endpoints and the dictionary, they're fundamental. They provide a foundation for learning. But what do you need to add to the foundation? How do we get to this concept called minimal viable documentation? Well, there are a lot of good examples out there. And the people behind API the Docs have also created a website and a set of awards called devportalawards.org. In preparation for this talk, I looked at some of the examples presented there. But before we do that, since we're talking about RESTful APIs, let's back up a second. As some of you may know, RESTful APIs came from a dissertation by Roy Fielding. And seriously, when he created the dissertation and created the term RESTful, he must have had marketing in mind because when something is RESTful, it makes at least makes me think of an easy button. And whenever there's an easy button in coding, this is the image I get and how I, it makes me feel. But how do you get to this in reality? How do you get to a good developer experience? The secret here to get to a good developer experience is to have at least a functional user experience. And for that, you need documentation. Is this the kind of documentation you want? Well, you look at this wall of text, and I'm going to rely on The Onion, which is a US humor magazine for the response. I mean, seriously, you want text that actually provides a good experience. Because today, we write for people who don't read. You think about that and it doesn't make a lot of sense until you understand the background behind that. The spoiler, people don't read documentation, they scan docs. So how do you help your readers scan your content? It's time to step back and cover a couple of tenets of technical writing. When you create a page of documentation, you want to focus key information in your first two paragraphs. And for the remainder of that page, for subsequent paragraphs, the first three to five words of every paragraph are critical. That'll tell the reader, oh yeah, I'm interested in that too. So how do you walk in the shoes of your readers? typically developers. Well, in a previous talk, Christoph presented 11 tenets of ideal world de documentation. When I first saw this slide, I thought, yeah, that all makes sense. But then I looked at the slide as a whole and I thought, 
oh my God, am I going to have to do all that? I mean, seriously. We all have busy jobs. I mean, at least if we're fortunate and we have deadlines. So the question here, backing up, is why would anyone use my API? That's the answer you want to, to answer in your documentation. And if you do it properly, you do it with minimal viable documentation. Keep it simple. If you do that and if you present it properly, your readers will be able to say, oh my gosh, this works for me at a glance. So how do we keep it simple? Do we have to cover all 11 points in Christoph's slide? Well, Christoph followed up fortunately with a simpler slide. What are the minimum requirements? So let's take a quick look at this slide. You scan it and you see at the bottom, how can I reach you? Support contact details. That's straightforward. You can put an email address, a support form, even a telephone number on your web page and say, check, that's done. So we do that and we'll cover the four other details and call that minimal viable documentation. So starting with the landing page, now that the world is in the middle of a quarantine, I guess I could say many of us used to fly to conferences like this. Oh, how things have changed. But you can still imagine you're flying someplace with your RESTful API. You land at a hub airport and you need to be routed to some endpoint. You're hoping for clear instructions how to get there a good experience at your hub airport. In a few cases, you may need to go through another hub, and that's okay, but how do you get to that good experience? Here, I cite some examples. One example that stood the test of time in, in previous talks is Twitter. This is their landing page for the, their APIs. They have use cases on top, simply stated, one or two word use cases. And they have endpoints you can scan on that same page. To me, that's mind blowing. A lot of people cite Stripe as an exemplar of excellent API docs, and in many ways they are. They have their use cases in the middle. They have their products on the left-hand pane. All but one are one word, and they're descriptive. They tell you, hey, this is what's going on. You click on that, you get examples that you can follow for quote unquote easy wins. So, what are the takeaways from this for landing pages? Number one, you want a functional user experience. And since I can't go into depth on how to get to a good user experience, that's really a different talk, I'm going to cite a principle based on this book, which I like. Don't make me think. Seriously, if your user experience is making the user think, then you're doing it wrong. So what's the action plan out of this? Number one, you want to set up what you can do and what your customers might want to do in use cases. Number two, you want to lay out your API functionality and coordinate it with your use cases. And when you do that, you want to follow the principles of, of creating a good user experience. Next are tutorials. The reality in the web space, we want to create tutorials that serve the whole audience all at once. If we can deliver our training once and it serves everybody, we think, yay, this is great. But what a customer wants is hands-on instruction, something customized for their particular needs. So how do you compromise? How do you get between the two? The way I like to do it is with samples. 
you provide a variety of use cases for people. You let them customize and you let them check, you check out the use cases in playgrounds that you provide. For me, use cases are like going to a buffet. You help people see, okay, this is the selection we have available, and some people may want barbecue, and some people might want tofu with hollandaise sauce. Let the customer pick what they want. So what are some examples of how people present use cases? The Orange developer site a couple of years ago, they had straightforward depictions of use cases based on single words. Quote unquote, they improved the site with more detail. I personally agree with, pardon me, I personally disagree with this movement towards more detail, but everybody is entitled to their opinion on this. Another example, the next mode developer site. They have use cases that seem scattershot, but the principle is let's serve people up a buffet and let people pick and choose what they need. And that's great. And once people pick and choose, they can customize. They can salt to taste, salting to taste by providing their own URLs, their own access tokens. And they have once they do that, they have use cases that meet their needs. So how do you do that? You may want to provide your own test playground, but there are also excellent third-party test playgrounds available. And the convenience associated with test playgrounds is that they enable customization. They allow you to set a, for example, set a variable for a customer URL and let that variable flow through your API. And then your customer will be happy and say, hey, this API actually works for me. When you have a test playground, you're also integrating your foundation, your dictionary, your API endpoints. And when you do that, you're enhancing your developer experience. So what are the takeaways from this? What do you want? Tutorials that reflect what happens in the real world. You want to be able to let your customers customize what you provide. And you want to provide test playgrounds so customers can see for themselves, hey, this works for me. So how do you get there? You provide use cases as a story. You let people insert their URLs in whatever samples you provide. And I've covered discussions of custom playgrounds. So 304, details. Some of you may recognize these endpoints from the old OpenAPI 2.0 Swagger Pet Store. And this is great as it allowed people to look under the hood of an API. If you appreciate cars, you appreciate the cleanliness of this interface. It allows you to look under the hood and see all the moving parts and see how they work. So how do you provide a user experience that's equivalent? How do you make it easier for your users to look under the hood of your API. I'll cover these five points in the following slides. First, you want to respect newer users or busier users. I mean, seriously, we may be experts in RESTful APIs, but our users may not be. I mean, you may have an admin who, who works all day with SOAP and then realizes, oh my gosh, I've got to make this API work as well. The Erst API Hub does a great, great job with this in their reference documentation by starting with the basics, reminding people, hey, this is what RESTful APIs are all about. 
My former employer, Forge Rock, they organize their endpoints. I mean, they have hundreds of them, but if you have to scan through them all, that's not the easiest thing to do. If you organize them, you help people find the endpoints they need. And Stripe, within their API documentation, provides curl commands, which you can copy and paste into your CLI and see how they work for you. We have another example of a demo environment. Uh, this is from Aiden. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I have here a payments endpoint. I click on the playground and I see, oh, this is JSON format input on how to set up an order. I click run and I see, ah, it's a 200. I've successfully charged a specific credit card for an order. Gosh, this works for me. And since I work for GitLab and we're moving to GraphQL, I feel like I need to illustrate what we do as well. We have a GraphQL Explorer for which I've set up a specific issue that describes the work that we do. I click play and I find information about the issue. If I want more about the issue, I can add more in the JSON based request. No, not JSON, pardon me, YAML. I click play and I get, get a good result as well, giving me more information. And if I want more details, I can click on docs. And this gives me more information about each of the properties they're in. And once I get something working, I feel like I've gone to the casino and hit a minor jackpot. And this is the feeling you want your readers to get. In other words, if you give people a good user experience, you bring them to a good developer experience. So what are the takeaways from this section? Well, if you get a world of endpoints based on Swagger, which is now the Open API initiative, that's not enough. You need more. So what's the action plan here? Repeating the five steps showed earlier. You explain the basics of what's a RESTful API. You organize your endpoints. You provide curl commands for each of your endpoints. Ideally, you want demo environments so people can see for themselves that your API can actually work for them. And you do it in a way that enhances the developer experience. Now, step four of four, sharing your works in progress sharing hope and keeping with the spirit of being minimal i've split this up into three sections number one release notes what do you need in release notes at minimum you need two things describe what's new describe what's changed with that information people can look at your release notes and say ah for this release this is what's, what's I can do. And this is what I have to watch out for. Blog posts. This is your opportunity to go beyond your documentation, to colloquially talk about what your product can do in a relatable and conversational way, using language that goes beyond what you see in typical documentation to say, hey, these are the use cases. These are the experiences that we have with such cases. And finally, roadmaps. These provide your plans for the future. Having people understand roadmaps that they're not necessarily a commitment that you're going to do something, but they're, they are a commitment that you're going to try to do something and that provides your customers hope. Number one, hey, they're listening to me. Number two, this is something I have to look forward to. So what are the takeaways here? 
you want three things for your works in progress. You want viable release notes. Ideally, you'll also want to share blogs with the community and also share roadmaps to say, hey, there's hope for the future. With that in hand, we finished the journey towards minimal viable documentation. And yes, the science is a marathon, but if you look carefully, the timing is that of a half marathon, because seriously, this is minimal. And once again, here's the link to my slides. And with that, since I have a minute to share, I'm going to share a bit from my dog, Katie. She's a Labrador, and she gets the ball, and that gives me an opportunity and context to thank my employer, GitLab, for giving me the time and space to prepare this presentation for you. Thanks very much. <laughs>